Thou must know, sire, that my father was Mahmud, the king of this country, the Black Isles, so called from the four little mountains which were once islands, while the capital was the place where now the great lake lies. My story will tell you how these changes came about. My father died when he was 66 and I succeeded him. I married my cousin whom I loved tenderly and I thought she loved me too. But one afternoon when I was half asleep and was being fanned by two of her maids, I heard one say to the other, What a pity it is that our mistress no longer loves our master. I believe she would like to kill him if she could, for she is an enchantress. I soon found by watching that they were right, and when I mortally wounded a favourite slave of hers for a great crime, she begged that she might build a palace in the garden, where she wept and bewailed him for two years. At last I begged her to cease grieving for him, for although he could not speak or move, by her enchantments she just kept him alive. She turned upon me in a rage and said over me some magic words, and I instantly became, as you see me now, half man and half marble. Then this wicked enchantress changed the capital, which was a very populous and flourishing city, into the lake and desert plain you saw. The fish of four colours which are in it are the different races who lived in the town. The four hills are the four islands which give the name to my kingdom. All this the enchantress told me to add to my troubles. And this is not all. Every day she comes and beats me with a whip of buffalo hide. When the young king had finished his sad story, he burst once more into tears and the sultan was much moved. Tell me, he cried, where is this wicked woman, and where is the miserable object of her affection, whom she just manages to keep alive? Where she lives I do not know, answered the unhappy prince, but she goes every day at sunrise to see if the slave can yet speak to her, after she has beaten me. Unfortunate king, said the sultan, I will do what I can to avenge you. So he consulted with the young king over the best way to bring this about, and they agreed their plan should be put in effect the next day. The sultan then rested, and the young king gave himself up to happy hopes of release. The next day the sultan arose, and then went to the palace in the garden, where the black slave was. He drew his sword and destroyed the little life that remained in him, and then threw the body down a well. He then lay down on the couch where the slave had been, and waited for the enchantress. She went first to the young king, whom she beat with a hundred blows. Then she came to the room where she thought her wounded slave was, but where the sultan really lay. She came near his couch and said, Are you better today, my dear slave? Speak but one word to me. How can I be better? answered the sultan, imitating the language of the Ethiopians, when I can never sleep for the cries and groans of your husband. What joy to hear you speak, answered the queen. Do you wish him to regain his proper shape? Yes, said the sultan. Hasten to set him at liberty so that I may no longer hear his cries. The queen at once went out and took a cup of water and said over it some words that made it boil as if it were on the fire. Then she threw it over the prince, who at once regained his own form. He was filled with joy, but the enchantress said, Hasten away from this place and never come back lest I kill you. So he hid himself to see the end of the Sultan's plan. The Enchantress went back to the Palace of Tears and said, Now I have done what you wished. What you have done, said the Sultan, is not enough to cure me. Every day at midnight all the people whom you have changed into fish lift their heads out of the lake and cry for vengeance. Go quickly and give them their proper shape. The Enchantress hurried away and said some words over the lake. The fish then became men, women and children, and the houses and shops were once more filled. The Sultan's suite, who had encamped by the lake, were not a little astonished to see themselves in the middle of a large and beautiful town. As soon as she had disenchanted it, the Queen went back to the palace. Are you quite well now? she said. Come near, said the Sultan. Nearer still. She obeyed. Then he sprang up, and with one blow of his sword he cut her in two. Then he went and found the prince. Rejoice, he said, your cruel enemy is dead. The prince thanked him again and again. And now, said the sultan, I will go back to my capital, which I am glad to find is so near yours. So near mine, said the king of the Black Isles. Do you know it is a whole year's journey from here? You came here in a few hours because it was enchanted. But I will accompany you on your journey. 
It will give me much pleasure if you will escort me, said the Sultan, and as I have no children, I will make you my heir. The Sultan and the Prince set out together, the Sultan laden with rich presents from the King of the Black Isles. The day after he reached his capital, the Sultan assembled his court and told them all that had befallen him, and told them how he intended to adopt the young king as his heir. Then he gave each man presents in proportion to his rank. As for the fisherman, as he was the first cause of the deliverance of the young prince, the Sultan gave him much money and made him and his family happy for the rest of their days. In the reign of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, there lived at Baghdad a porter who, in spite of his humble calling, was an intelligent and sensible man. One morning he was sitting in his usual place with his basket before him, waiting to be hired, when a tall young lady, covered with a long muslin veil, came up to him and said, Pick up your basket and follow me. The porter, who was greatly pleased by her appearance and voice, jumped up at once, poised his basket on his head, and accompanied the lady, saying to himself as he went, Oh, happy day! Oh, lucky meeting! The lady soon stopped before a closed door, at which she knocked. It was opened by an old man with a long white beard, to whom the lady held out money without speaking. The old man, who seemed to understand what she wanted, vanished into the house and returned bringing a large jar of wine, which the porter placed in his basket. Then the lady signed to him to follow, and they went their way. The next place she stopped at was a fruit and flower shop, and here she bought a large quantity of apples, apricots, peaches and other things, with lilies, jasmine and all sorts of sweet-smelling plants. From this shop she went to a butcher's, a grocer's and a poulterer's, till at last the porter exclaimed in despair, My good lady, if you had only told me you were going to buy enough provisions to stock a town, I would have brought a horse, or rather a camel. The lady laughed and told him she had not finished yet, but after choosing various kinds of scents and spices from a druggist's store, she halted before a magnificent palace, at the door of which she knocked gently. The portress who opened it was of such beauty that the eyes of the man were quite dazzled, and he was the more astonished as he saw clearly that she was no slave. The lady who had led him hither stood watching him with amusement, till the porteress exclaimed, Why don't you come in, my sister? This poor man is so heavily weighed down that he is ready to drop. When they were both inside, the door was fastened, and they all three entered a large court, surrounded by an open-work gallery. At one end of the court was a platform, and on the platform stood an amber throne supported by four ebony columns, garnished with pearls and diamonds. In the middle of the court stood a marble basin filled with water from the mouth of a golden lion. The porter looked about him, noticing and admiring everything, but his attention was specially attracted by a third lady sitting on the throne, who was even more beautiful than the other two. By the respect shown to her by the others, he judged that she must be the eldest, and in this he was right. This lady's name was Zobeda, the porteress was Sadie, and the housekeeper was Amina. At a word from Zobeda, Sadie and Amina took the basket from the porter, who was glad enough to be relieved from its weight, and when it was emptied, paid him handsomely for its use. But instead of taking up his basket and going away, the man still lingered, till Zobeda inquired what he was waiting for, and if he expected more money. "'Oh, madam,' returned he, "'you have already given me too much, and I fear I may have been guilty of rudeness in not taking my departure at once. But, if you will pardon my saying so, I was lost in astonishment at seeing such beautiful ladies by themselves. A company of women without men is, however, as dull as a company of men without women. And after telling some stories to prove his point, he ended by entreating them to let him stay and make a fourth at their dinner. The ladies were rather amused at the man's assurances, and after some discussion, it was agreed that he should be allowed to stay, as his society might prove entertaining. But listen, friend, said Zobeda, if we grant your request, it is only on condition that you behave with the utmost politeness and that you keep the secret of our way of living which chance has revealed to you. Then they all sat down to table, which had been covered by Amina with the dishes she had bought. After the first few mouthfuls, Amina poured some wine into a golden cup. 
She first drank herself, according to the Arab custom, and then filled it for her sisters. When it came to the porter's turn, he kissed Amina's hand and sang a song, which he composed at the moment in praise of the wine. The three ladies were pleased with the song and then sang themselves, so that the repast was a merry one and lasted much longer than usual. At length, seeing that the sun was about to set, Sadia said to the porter, Rise and go, it is now time for us to separate. Oh, madam, replied he, how can you desire me to quit you in the state in which I am? Between the wine I have drunk and the pleasure of seeing you, I should never find the way to my house. Let me remain here till morning, and when I have recovered my senses, I will go when you like. Let him stay, said Amina, who had before proved herself his friend. It is only just, as he has given us so much amusement. If you wish it, my sister, replied Zobeda, but if he does, I must make a new condition. Porter, she continued, turning to him, if you remain, you must promise to ask no questions about anything you may see. If you do, you may perhaps hear what you don't like. This being settled, Amina brought in supper and lit up the hall with a number of sweet-smelling tapers. They then sat down again at the table and began with fresh appetites to eat, drink, sing and recite verses. In fact, they were all enjoying themselves mightily when they heard a knock at the outer door which Sadie rose to open. She soon returned, saying that three calendars, all blind in the right eye and all with their heads, faces and eyebrows clean-shaved, begged for admittance as they were newly arrived in Baghdad and night had already fallen. They seem to have pleasant manners, she added, but you have no idea how funny they look. I am sure we should find their company diverting. Zobeda and Amina made some difficulty about admitting the newcomers, and Sadie knew the reason of their hesitation, but she urged the matter so strongly that Zobeda was at last forced to consent. Bring them in then, said she, but make them understand that they are not to make remarks about what does not concern them, and be sure to make them read the inscription over the door. For on the door was written in letters of gold, Whoso meddles in affairs that are no business of his will hear truths that will not please him. The three calendars bowed low on entering and thanked the ladies for their kindness and hospitality. The ladies replied with words of welcome and they were all about to seat themselves when the eyes of the calendars fell on the porter, whose dress was not so very unlike their own, though he still wore all the hair that nature had given him. This, said one of them, is apparently one of our Arab brothers who has rebelled against our ruler. The porter, although half asleep from the wine he had drunk, heard the words and without moving cried angrily to the calendar, Sit down and mind your own business. Did you not read the inscription over the door? Everybody is not obliged to live in the same way. Do not be so angry, my good man, replied the calendar. We should be very sorry to displease you. So the quarrel was smoothed over and supper began in good earnest. When the calendars had satisfied their hunger, they offered to play to their hostesses if there were any instruments in the house. The ladies were delighted at the idea and Sadie went to see what she could find, returning in a few moments laden with two different kinds of flutes and a tambourine. Each calendar took the one he preferred and began to play a well-known air while the ladies sang the words of the song. These words were the gayest and liveliest possible and every now and then the singers had to stop to indulge the laughter which almost choked them. In the midst of all their noise, a knock was heard at the door. Now, early that evening, the caliph secretly left the palace, accompanied by his grand vizier, Giafar and Mesrur, chief of the eunuchs, all three wearing the dresses of merchants. Passing down the street, the caliph had been attracted by the music of instruments and the sound of laughter, and had ordered his vizier to go and knock at the door of the house as he wished to enter. The vizier replied that the ladies who lived there seemed to be entertaining their friends, and he thought his master would do well not to intrude on them. But the caliph had taken it into his head to see for himself, and insisted on being obeyed. The knock was answered by Sadie, with a taper in her hand, and the vizier, who was surprised at her beauty, bowed low before her, and said respectfully, Madame, we are three merchants who have lately arrived from Mosul, and owing to a misadventure which befell us this very night, 
only reached our inn to find that the doors were closed to us till tomorrow morning. Not knowing what to do, we wandered in the streets till we happened to pass your house, when, seeing lights and hearing the sound of voices, we resolved to ask you to give us shelter till the dawn. If you will grant us this favour, we will, with your permission, do all in our power to help you spend the time pleasantly. Sadie answered the merchant that she must first consult her sisters, and after having talked over the matter with them, she returned to tell him that he and his two friends would be welcome to join their company. They entered and bowed politely to the ladies and their guests. Then Zubaida, as the mistress, came forward and said gravely, You are welcome here, but I hope you will allow me to beg one thing of you. Have as many eyes as you like, but no tongues, and ask no questions about anything you see, however strange it may appear to you. Madam, returned the vizier, you shall be obeyed. We have quite enough to please and interest us without troubling ourselves about that with which we have no concern. Then they all sat down and drank to the health of the newcomers. While the vizier, Jafar, was talking to the ladies, the caliph was occupied in wondering who they could be and why the three calendars had each lost his right eye. He was burning to inquire the reason of it all, but was silenced by Zubaydah's request. So he tried to rouse himself and to take his part in the conversation, which was very lively, the subject of discussion being the many different sorts of pleasures that there were in the world. After some time, the calendars got up and performed some curious dances, which delighted the rest of the company. When they had finished, Zubaydah rose from her seat, and taking Amina by the hand, she said to her, My sister, our friends will excuse us if we seem to forget their presence and fulfil our nightly task. Amina understood her sister's meaning, and collecting the dishes, glasses and musical instruments, she carried them away, while Sadie swept the hall and put everything in order. Having done this, she begged the calendars to sit on a sofa on one side of the room, and the caliph and his friends to place themselves opposite. As to the porter, she requested him to come and help her and her sister. Shortly after, Amina entered, carrying a seat, which she put down in the middle of the empty space. She next went over to the door of a closet and signed to the porter to follow her. He did so, and soon reappeared, leading two black dogs by a chain, which he brought into the centre of the hall. Zobeda then got up from her seat between the calendars and the caliph, and walked slowly across to where the porter stood with the dogs. We must do our duty, she said with a deep sigh, pushing back her sleeves and taking a whip from Sadie. She said to the man, Take one of those dogs to my sister Amina and give me the other. The porter did as he was bid, but as he led the dog to Zubaydah, it uttered piercing howls and gazed up at her with looks of entreaty. But Zubaydah took no notice and whipped the dog till she was out of breath. She then took the chain from the porter and raising the dog on its hind legs, they looked into each other's eyes sorrowfully till tears began to fall from both. Then Zobaida took her handkerchief and wiped the dog's eyes tenderly, after which she kissed it. Then, putting the chain into the porter's hand, she said, Take it back to the closet and bring me the other. The same ceremony was gone through with the second dog, and all the while the whole company looked on with astonishment. The caliph in particular could hardly contain himself, and made signs to the vizier to ask what it all meant. But the vizier pretended not to see, and turned his head away. Zubaydah remained for some time in the middle of the room, till at last Sadie went up to her and begged her to sit down, as she also had her part to play. At these words, Amina fetched a lute from a case of yellow satin and gave it to Sadie, who sang several songs to its accompaniment. When she was tired, she said to Amina, My sister, I can do no more. Come, I pray you, and take my place. Amina struck a few chords and then broke into a song, which she sang with so much ardour that she was quite overcome, and sank gasping on a pile of cushions, tearing open her dress as she did so to give herself some air. To the amazement of all present, her neck, instead of being as smooth and white as her face, was a mass of scars. The calendars and the caliph looked at each other and whispered together, unheard by Zubaydah and Sadie, who were tending their fainting sister. What does it all mean? asked the caliph. We know no more than you, 
said the calendar to whom he had spoken. What? You do not belong to the house? My lord, answered all the calendars together. We came here for the first time an hour before you. They then turned to the porter to see if he could explain the mystery, but the porter was no wiser than they were themselves. At length the caliph could contain his curiosity no longer, and declared that he would compel the ladies to tell them the meaning of their strange conduct. The vizier, foreseeing what would happen, implored him to remember the condition their hostesses had imposed, and added in a whisper that if his highness would only wait till morning, he could as caliph summon the ladies to appear before him. But the caliph, who was not accustomed to be contradicted, rejected this advice, and it was resolved, after a little more talking, that the question should be put by the porter. Suddenly Zobaida turned round, and seeing their excitement, she said, What is the matter? What are you all discussing so earnestly? Madam, answered the porter, these gentlemen entreat you to explain to them why you should first whip the dogs and then cry over them, and also how it happens that the fainting lady is covered with scars. They have requested me, madam, to be their mouthpiece. Is it true, gentlemen, asked Zobeda, drawing herself up, that you have charged this man to put me that question? It is, they all replied, except Giafar, who was silent. Is this, continued Zobeda, growing more angry every moment, is this the return you make for the hospitality I have shown you? Have you forgotten the one condition on which you were allowed to enter the house? Come quickly, she added, clapping her hands three times, and the words were hardly uttered when seven black slaves, each armed with a sabre, burst in and stood over the seven men, throwing them on the ground and preparing themselves on a sign from their mistress to cut off their heads. The seven culprits all thought their last hour had come, and the caliph repented bitterly that he had not taken the vizier's advice. But they made up their minds to die bravely, all except the porter, who loudly inquired of Zubaydah why he was to suffer for other people's faults, and declared that these misfortunes would never have happened if it had not been for the calendars, who always brought ill luck. He ended by imploring Zubaydah not to confound the innocent with the guilty, and to spare his life. In spite of her anger, there was something so comic in the groans of the porter that Zobeda could not refrain from laughing. But putting him aside, she addressed the others a second time, saying, Answer me, who are you? Unless you tell me truly, you have not another moment to live. I can hardly think you are men of any position, whatever country you belong to. If you were, you would have had more consideration for us. The caliph who was naturally very impatient, suffered far more than either of the others at feeling that his life was at the mercy of a justly offended lady. But when he heard her question, he began to breathe more freely, for he was convinced that she had only to learn his name and rank for all danger to be over. So he whispered hastily to the vizier who was next to him to reveal their secret. But the vizier, wiser than his master, wished to conceal from the public the affront they had received and merely answered, After all, we have only got what we deserved. Meanwhile, Zubeda had turned to the three calendars and inquired if, as they were all blind, they were brothers. No, madam, replied one. We are no blood relations at all, only brothers by our mode of life. And you, she asked, addressing another, were you born blind of one eye? No, madam, returned he. I became blind through a most surprising adventure such as probably has never happened to anybody. After that I shaved my head and eyebrows and put on the dress in which you see me now. Zobeda put the same question to the other two calendars and received the same answer. But, added the third, it may interest you, madam, to know that we are not men of low birth, but are all three sons of kings, and of kings too, whom the world holds in high esteem. At these words, Zobeda's anger cooled down and she turned to her slaves and said, You can give them a little more liberty, but do not leave the hall. Those that will tell us their histories and their reasons for coming here shall be allowed to leave unhurt. Those who refuse... And she paused, but in a moment, the porter, who understood that he had only to relate his story to set himself free from this terrible danger, immediately broke in. Madam, you know already how I came here, and what I have to say will soon be told. Your sister found me this morning in the place where I always stand waiting to be hired. She bade me follow her to various shops, and when my basket was quite full, 
we returned to this house, when you had the goodness to permit me to remain, for which I shall be eternally grateful. That is my story. He looked anxiously to Zobeda, who nodded her head and said, You can go, and take care we never meet again. Oh, madam, cried the porter, let me stay yet a little while. It is not just that the others should have heard my story, and that I should not hear theirs. And without waiting for permission, he seated himself on the end of the sofa occupied by the ladies, whilst the rest crouched on the carpet, and the slaves stood against the wall. Then one of the calendars, addressing himself to Zobeda as the principal lady, began his story.